For our first interview, we are joined by Jean-Marie Gueno, who is the director of the Kent Global Leadership Programme on Conflict Resolution, as well as a former Undersecretary General for Peacekeeping Operations. Jean-Marie is a professor at the School of International and Public Affairs of Columbia University, as well as a member of the United Nations High Level Advisory Board on Mediation and the UN Advisory Board on Disarmament Matters. He's also a published author. Wow. So please welcome Mr. Gueno for our first interview of Peacekeepers Live 2023. Welcome, Mr. Gueno. Nice to be here with you and nice to celebrate Peacekeepers Day with you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It's amazing to see you again. So you're the former Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping Operations. Could you tell us about your career and your work at the United Nations? Well, you know, I arrived at the United Nations in uh, 2000, in the fall of 2000, just uh, a couple of weeks after the Brahimi report uh, had been issued. I mean, the Brahimi report was really the report that was supposed to put peacekeeping back on the right track after the tragedies of Rwanda, of Srebrenica, of Somalia. And uh, I remember actually my first day at the United Nations. Uh, we had a big meeting in a house near New York there was, uh, there was Kofi Annan, of course, there was Sergio de Mello, there was Lagda Brahimi, there was Bernard Kushner, uh, really giants of uh, the United Nations. And uh, I saw that my job was going to be to turn aspirations into uh, reality. And uh, I did not know that I would stay for eight years at the UN, that I would become the longest serving, serving uh, undersecretary for peacekeeping. But I felt that having this opportunity to change for the better the life of others was an extremely good, wonderful thing that happened to me. There is, it's rare in life that you have this sense that you can make a positive impact on the lives of thousands of people. And that's what I tried to do over the, those eight years at the United Nations with Kofi Annan and then Ban Ki-moon. Absolutely incredible. Wow. As you say, what a privilege uh, and a position to be in. Extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. So we're celebrating, Jean-Marie, 75 years of UN peacekeeping. Could you tell us about peacekeepers, the work they carry out and the challenges they face? Well, you know, peacekeeping has uh, never stopped reinventing itself. It started with observers uh, then troops were deployed after the Suez crisis. Uh, when I joined the UN, the ambitions became much more ambitious. It was really about, in a way, rebuilding countries. Maybe at the time we were almost too uh, ambitious. Uh, but uh, that creates enormous challenges for the peacekeepers because uh, in the old definition of peacekeeping, so to speak, uh, they were just... Uh, uh, task to monitor ceasefire to uh, uh, and that was usually between two states uh, which have a reputation to protect so I don't I'm not saying it was an easier task but it was yes it was an easy less difficult task let's say than uh, what they have to do now where they are confronted with uh, non-state actors uh, where situations of uh, neither full war nor full peace. You know, the Brahimi report says uh, no peacekeeping, no peacekeepers where there is no peace to keep. The reality of the United Nations today is that all, all the big peacekeeping missions are deployed in places where we are a long way from peace. I mean, you think of Mali, you think of Central African Republic, etc. I mean, it's, uh, it's a very dangerous situation. And and that puts a, a big uh, onus on the peacekeepers because they, I think it's the only activity where tactical decisions can have a strategic impact. Let me, let me illustrate that. You know, you have a patrol in the middle of nowhere and then you find a roadblock. And what are you going to do? Are you going to force your way through the roadblock? Are you going to turn around because you don't want to do it? Are you going to negotiate? Uh, there is no obvious answer, and this, and you're not going to ask headquarters for what the right answer is. You have to make the decision 
on the spot, uh, judging, uh, you know, what's the what's the dynamic of the situation. That requires very good local command, the, 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 the head of the patrol, a very good local command. Because if you get the wrong decision, if let's say if you force your way through and then you you have casualties and things don't work out, it's the whole mission that is in danger. If you turn around, uh, you can project an impression of weakness, and that will spill over to the whole perception of the mission. So these little tactical decisions on the field, uh, they are enormously uh, difficult to make. And then there is the, the broader agenda that, that I was alluding to, the fact that uh, now it's not just about uh, ceasefires, it's not just about stabilization, it's just not about protection of civilians, it's, it's helping a state uh, rebuild uh, itself. And that requires a lot of uh, flair and a sense of the local dynamics. And there you are, a foreigner in a country that you will never know as well as the people of the country. Uh, you have to show humility. You have to understand that uh, it's not your future, it's their future. So you, you may help, you may nudge, uh, but you should never... Uh, push to the point uh, where you become a kind of neocolonial power. And so that finesse, that subtlety in the engagement, that requires a very solid and inspired uh, leadership of the of the mission. So I think that the peacekeepers have never had uh, a more important mission. Uh, at the same time, I think you have also to see that uh, the Security Council is divided, so they don't have the solid coordinated push of the big powers there are divisions in the security council so you you need to build your credibility through the quality of your advice the difference you make in the lives of people uh, no easy task but an indispensable task now because if if states collapse if uh, areas of non-governed space extend uh, that's catastrophic for the world that's catastrophic for the people concerned and that's catastrophic for the rest of the world Amazing. Thank you for that answer. Um, what actions have you seen during your career in the United Nations that have inspired you, that inspired you to believe that peace is possible? You know, what, what has inspired me is the people I have met in difficult situations, because in those situations of conflict, you see the worst of humanity, but you, you also see the best of humanity. I remember very well being in Ituri uh, in the middle of a very serious uh, crisis that could have turned into another genocide. And uh, there were a few people there. I mean, I remember uh, a woman, a Congolese woman, Antoinette Vaveka, and I'm happy to, uh, to pay tribute to her today, who by force of will, by uh, uh, her commitment to peace, was an inspiration to all. I have seen it with uh, local, with people from the country, from the host countries. I have seen it with peacekeepers. And that's what gives me hope, is that in situations of danger, in tragic situation, uh, you the best of humanity can also uh, come up. And uh, that's also, uh, to be honest, what I find extraordinary in peacekeeping is that uh, in normal life, uh, you never, I mean, it's its gray and there is, uh, you're not tested. Uh, in those situations, you have to prove your mettle. Uh, and the people I, I, met, I worked with at the UN, many of them uh, did precisely that. So can you tell me what's the UN? It's a big question, this, and, and obviously we, we, we really need a lot of time to answer it, but we're trying to do these last few questions in about six minutes, Mr. Gueno. But what's the UN's greatest challenge and what's the UN's greatest strength? Well, the UN, you, know, it's, you, you remind us that it's, uh, it's more than 75 years old uh, now, but it's still very much ahead of its time. <laughs> And so its its strength and its weakness, in a way, are the same because it's it derives its strength from the collective commitment of its member states. If that commitment isn't there, the UN is uh, is very weak. Uh, you know, the UN has to project the collective will of its member states. 
Uh, and at the same time, it has to be much more than the lowest common denominator of its member state. It has to, uh, it has to look ahead. Uh, and so that balance in the UN is extraordinarily difficult to to manage for a secretary general or for any senior official. Because if you if you antagonize the member states, if they don't, if you don't have them with you, you're not going to go very far. But if you are seen just as a kind of puppet of their instrument, uh, you're not going to be respected. You're not going to be trusted. You know, myself, um, I am French, and I knew that when I was appointed, uh, of course, my passport played a role. The Secretary General wanted the distribution between the uh, uh, balance between uh, various uh, P5. Uh, but I, I thought my duty was then to prove that uh, it was not just that my, my passport, that I would demonstrate to my people and to the people I was coming to help that I was not an instrument of France. I was an ins instrument of the United Nations. Uh, I And uh, Kofi Annan uh, used to say that I had been blued. <laughs> uh, that was his expression. I think that's, you know, that's the challenge and, uh, and the, the challenge of the, of the UN, its strength and its weakness. It mobilizes states, but it has to go beyond them. Absolutely fascinating. Fascinating. So how can individuals, you know, who are listening, who are out there, how can they support the work of the United Nations? And in fact, can they? Well, they can first by understanding what the UN is. And what you see, uh, what you see today, as you saw yesterday, is that the expectations uh, of humanity with the UN are enormous. Uh, in all opinion polls, uh, there is a sense that at a time of global problems like climate change, like uh, pandemics, more than ever, you need international cooperation. That's, uh, that's obvious. At the same time, as I said, the UN cannot be much more than its member states. Uh, it cannot uh, go against, uh, against them. So, uh, often there is that gap and in a way that frustration because people say, oh, the UN isn't doing anything. No, the UN, it's us. It's us who are not uh, supporting it enough. So when you ask the question, you know, how can individuals uh, uh, help the UN? Well, they can help the UN by making clear in their communication, in the way they act, that it is their organization. It's not an organization out there on planet Mars. It's the expression of the will of humanity. And of course, there is an ambiguity in the UN Charter. It's uh, the UN, the, the, the United Nations is an organization of states, but the UN Charter starts with we the people. And of course, the states, they are supposed to represent the people. Uh, sometimes uh, they don't uh, really. And that tension between being an organization of states and having as a mandate to support the people that is something that is never easy. But I think each of us in our individual actions, we can help if we understand that. And then if we promote the idea that without an international organization, without a sense of collective purpose, uh, the humanity will go into more and more uh, disasters. Mm, fascinating. Um, so look, we have a couple of minutes left and I've, I'd like to ask you one more question if I can. But we the peoples, as you say, what a wonderful way to start you know, that charter. Absolutely amazing. And of course, there's incredible social media to follow with the Secretary General and people like Melissa Fleming. You know, great accounts that we can watch to find out the very latest that's going on. But yes, without hearing from us and without them supporting, you know, then how could they, would they ever know to kind of follow some of the ideas that we have? So I completely agree with you. Please follow the United Nations. Let me ask ask you one thing to a young person who's out there listening who may well want to have a life like yours working for peacekeeping you know in our world or indeed joining the incredible united nations if you could say one thing we've got about a minute here if you could say one thing to inspire a young person on their journey what would it be well i think in life you know you have family you have friends and that's very important but uh, the greatest privilege in life, as I said at the beginning, is to be able to have a life that, is, that goes a bit beyond yourself. And I think that's what the UN uh, can provide, the sense that uh, in this uh, passage of life, you can make a difference. 
you can do something that is bigger than you. And it's not about vanity. It's about a sense that of leaving a little trace and helping uh, people and transforming the life of others. That is an enormous privilege. That's that's an inspiration uh, for life. That's, I think, uh, when you when you look back at your li- at your life, if you have a sense that every once in a while there are moments where you have helped others, well, you have a different sense of uh, how the life that life has gone. And I think for young people uh, looking to to go a little beyond themselves, uh, that's that's what they should be looking for because that's. That's the greatest luck you can have. Well, absolutely amazing. What a beautiful way to end a a wonderful interview. Thank you, Mr. Gweno, for speaking with us today from New York. Your commitment to a more peaceful and sustainable world is inspiring. It's been an honour, an absolute honour talking to you.